Palm Sunday, as Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem. Man, I wish I could have been part of that crowd. That seemed like such an exciting, exciting time for God's people and for all people of all nations, whether they realize it or not. And I love Palm Sunday. Actually, when I was a kid, it was one of my favorite Sundays of the year, which you're probably thinking, why? Like, you would think, like, you would look forward to, like, Christmas, right? Or Easter, you know, because you got your Easter basket or whatever, you know. But no, for me, it was Palm Sunday, because what the pastor would always do is, as a kid, he said, anytime I say Hosanna, you can scream back at me, Hosanna, Hosanna, and wave your palm branch. He said, this morning, a lot of I'm going to give you a palm branch. And anytime I say Hosanna, this is your opportunity here to be loud in church as loud as you want. Get it out now, you know, Roger and Cheryl, thank you for you. <laughs> and as you leave this morning, you can take one as well, but we're going to give this to Delilah right now. So Delilah, anytime I say Hosanna, I want you to wave this branch and say Hosanna back. How's that sound? Kind of like how you remember we do be done. I don't think we're today when you scream. Kind of like that. That's why it's for your time. I remember. Cheryl remembers. <laughs> So this morning's message is about Hosanna in the Hyatt. Hosanna! 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 Yeah, you got it. All right, you're going to like really surprise me. I'm going to get really into the sermon when I say it, how you thinking about it. You're going to get me this way. It'll be great. So that was my favorite reason why I love Palm Sunday. You can imagine, you know, we probably had 20 kids. Any kind of pastor would say, Hosanna! Hosanna! Oh, yeah! It was enough to get everybody woken up in the morning, which is great. So this morning, we're going to focus on the triumphal entry. Once again, this is one of my favorite Sundays as a kid, and we're going to be asking the question, why do we remember the triumphal entry? Why do we celebrate Palm Sunday? Yeah, we know it's the kickoff of Holy Week, and certainly there's a lot of important things that happen this week, but why do we take a Sunday to really celebrate Palm Sunday? What's the big deal about it? You know, why, what, are we, what are we doing here? So I just want to study, once again, in, Matthew's, in God's Word, Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. This gives us an account of Palm Sunday. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent his up two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with their colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took the place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did, just as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and placed their cloaks on Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches. The crowds that went ahead of him, and those that followed, shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! To the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Hosanna! God is heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I love reading God's word. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. We're building this up here. We're getting excited about this. So we're going to be talking about the four wise of Palm Sunday, answering the question, why do we celebrate this? Why is it such a big deal? What happened here? And as I was preparing this message and thinking about this Palm Sunday, I was doing the same thing. I'm like, okay, like, why, what is, why is this a big deal? Why are the things that Jesus read, why did it take place the way that they should have, why they did? So the first why that we're going to be answering to get an idea of why it's such a big deal and why things happen the way they did is, why the donkey, right? Why the donkey? And all the modes of transportation that Jesus could have rode in on, you know, to the city of Jerusalem, you know, during this time, there's kind of this coming out party, as we'll study here in a little moment in a moment. Why a donkey? You know, if it was me, you know, if I was Jesus, he could have came on anything. And, you know, I have a picture here of a, of a donkey, you know, when I think of donkeys, I usually think of Shrek. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, the donkey, donkey. And if you haven't seen that movie, you're missing it. I mean, where have you been? I mean, donkey, you know, what the fuck's <laughs> I don't do a very good impersonation, but we all know the donkey. But once again, why a donkey? If you've ever been around a donkey, there's not really much elegant about them. They're kind of about as uh, mean of an animal. I mean, they're nice, they're sweet, but come on. This is Jesus. He's entering the city of Jerusalem. All these people are here to meet them. If it was me, 
Yeah, I'll do this because I mean he's fully man, fully fully God. He could have got any animal. He could have got you know an elephant. If it was me, I would have gone right in a T Rex. I would have made a statement right there, riding in on a T Rex, Jurassic Park in the city of Jerusalem, or a dragon, or something like that, right? That's what I would want to do. If nothing else, like it looks like an elephant or something, right? But no, Jesus chose a donkey. We see in Matthew 21, says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, and with her pole by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you're supposed to say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So any time a king would come to the city, especially after our conquest, and this is very much popular throughout ancient culture, even in the Old Testament we see this, but in Roman culture the same thing. You would see the king coming into the city for a big parade. You know, we have parades today, where did that come from? It came from back then. When the king would come and ride through the city, and usually what was expected is the king would be on a horse or a chariot, something majestic. Now, okay, they may not have tea breakfast back then, but come on, it's Jesus. He could have done it, come on. Well, they suck, you know, they, the king would ride on tea breakfast, they would ride on a chariot. Here you see, you know, a Roman uh, Caesar, you know, coming into conquering here, or Rome coming into the city, and actually, you know, this is kind of what it would look like. And if you ever watched the movie at like, Gladiator, that's a good one. In the beginning of that movie, you see Caesar, the emperor, riding into the city and on an honest majestic steed or a majestic chariot. That's what would have been expected for a king to come riding through town for this promenade, for this great thing. It would be a moment of grandeur. It would be a moment of pomp and circumstance. The Romans would do this after conquest. But why, of all things, if what was expected for a king, especially the coming Messiah, to ride in a majestic form, would Jesus suit a donkey? Well, the first reason was this. It was prophesied. It was prophesied that the king, the Messiah, would come riding on a donkey. The victorious and righteous king would come not on a horse, not on a chariot, not on a dragon, as I would have liked, but a donkey. And we see that in Zechariah 9.9. It says, and that verse is actually part of the Matthew. It actually goes all back to that. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. According to prophecy, Jesus would come, the Messiah would come, riding in Jerusalem, not in majestic form, not on a, you know, this great mighty chariot, but no, on a donkey. And it's really incredible, if you look at the life of Jesus, all the prophecies that he fulfilled, whether it be going down to Egypt, or if you think about all the events surrounding Jesus' birth, Nobody could have done all those things except Jesus. There's no way. There were so many things that were prophesied about the Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled them all. And one of the things that was fulfilled was the donkey. So a good reason why Jesus chose the donkey, why he rode the donkey, is because that was prophesied about the Messiah. He was fulfilling that prophecy. Another reason why Jesus chose the donkey was this. It was a better fit for Jesus. It better represented who he was and what his mission was here on earth at that time. Did Jesus come to conquer? Did Jesus come to overthrow the Romans like many in the crowd wished that he did? Did Jesus come to be served, to be a king who people would come and, and worship and feed grapes and all those great things, pan and things like that, kind of like Herod or Caesar or maybe Pilate was used to, that kind of service? No. That wasn't Jesus' mission here on earth. Jesus came not to be served, but to save and to serve. The donkey was a better fit for Jesus. He didn't come to be conqueror. He came to be servant. The donkey was a sign of humility, the way that Jesus was humble. The donkey was a sign of a, a, a chariot. It wasn't, you know, if you think of the chariot, it was something a sign of vanity. It was a sign of pride. It was a sign of pomp and circumstance and elegance and all of these things that come with being a king. But Jesus wasn't that kind of king. He wasn't that kind of Messiah. And another thing about the donkey, it was a sign of peace. Riding in a donkey was a sign of peace. Even though everybody thought he was coming to bring rebellion. They thought Jesus was coming to bring this great uprising against Rome. That was not the case. The donkey was a better fit for Jesus and what his mission was. And thinking about Christ's humility, I want to read for you Philippians 2, verses 6 through 7. This gives us a picture of why Jesus would choose a donkey. It gives us a picture of the humility of Christ. It says, Jesus, 
who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in the human likeness. Jesus came in the very nature of a servant. He is the epitome of humility and what it means to serve. And that is why he chose the donkey over the majestic steed. He didn't come to conquer. He didn't come to, to be worshipped and be served. He came to go to the cross and to save human beings. So why the donkey, prophecy, and humility? It was a better fit for Jesus. The second question I got thinking of as I was preparing this week is thinking about Palm Sunday. Why the entry? What was Jesus doing? Wouldn't it have been much easier for Jesus just to, you know, slip through the city at night undetected or maybe, you know, came in and you know, wearing the skies or something so people wouldn't bother him. You know, when I think of the triumphal entry, that is like a parade. As I mentioned before, you know, we think of our parade today, it all kind of falls back to that premise of, you know, a great king coming into the city and the people lying in the streets. Now, today we don't have that. You know, we have, uh, you know, fire engines and different cool things that went on parades, but that was the ancient equivalent of a parade. And, you know, when I think of a parade, I picture there's a lot of, you know, Prince Ali on his, uh, on his, uh, his, uh, his, what's it, his uh, elephant there, in the movie The Lion, he's saying, look, I am here. And Jesus was doing the exact same thing. It was his coming out party. And we see that in the way it was received. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches. Now, spreading the cloaks, why would they do that? Why would people spread their cloaks? Well, that's something he did. The king. That's something he did for the royalty. I have a picture here of, uh, I forget what queen it is, but you know, she was walking and the, the duke saw her walking alone and he threw his cloak down so the queen didn't have to walk on the grass. That was something he did as a sign of honor and respect for royalty. That was a custom at the time. And we actually see that in the Old Testament. There's a pattern for that in the way that people would receive the Old Testament king. In 2 Kings 9.13 it says, Quickly they took their cloaks and spread on again the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. So we see a precedent of that, a precedent of that in the Old Testament. The Old Testament kings would come, they would throw palm branches, they would throw you know, the cloaks, whatever they could. It was a shine of respect, it was a shine of reverence for the king. So why the triumphal entry? Like I said, would not it have been easier for Jesus just to come in at night, not having all of the all of the loot and pomp and circumstances and having people know that Jesus was there? Did Jesus want people to know that he was the Messiah? Did he want them to know? You know, there's no question after the triumphal entry that Jesus was this is his coming out party, right? This is when Jesus proclaiming that he is the Messiah. But it's interesting. If you see previous the, in the gospel accounts, anytime somebody would come to the realization of who Jesus was, whether it be through a healing or the disciples just knowing him, he would tell them, Don't tell anybody. He didn't want people to know Jesus was the Messiah. Matthew 12, 15 through 16. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. Prior to this point, he didn't want people to tell him. He didn't want to go around people going around telling people that he was the Messiah. He wanted to keep it under wraps. Matthew 16, 15 through 16, and verse 20. Well, what do you say? What about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone. Okay, Jesus, what changed? You know, before you were keeping this under wraps, but now you're having a triumphal entry. You have to keep in mind that this was a time. This was a time for Jesus to come out and proclaim to the world that yes, he was the Messiah. Yes, he was the King of Kings, the Christ, the Son of God. He was openly declaring to the people that he was their King and the Messiah that they've been waiting for. This was there was no uh, there was no being no secrets now. You know, there was no waiting. This was Jesus' moment. Everything that Jesus had done has led to Holy Week, has led to this time. It was almost finished, the work on the cross. Jesus was not wasn't just announcing to, to Israel and to the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and to the world that the Christ had come and the Son was here. Why the triumphal entry? It was Jesus coming out party. He was announcing to everyone the Messiah had come. Third question. Why Hosanna? <laughs> we see this in verse 9. The crowds went ahead of him, 
and those who follow shall. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And it's important that we're answering the question, Why Hosanna? The answer, Hosanna! What does Hosanna mean? Hosanna! What does it mean? Well, here's what it means. It means save us. We pray, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. We pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The phrase, save us, we pray, in Hebrew, sounds like Hosanna. Hosanna! And if you actually look in your Bible, I know sometimes we don't do this, but I encourage you to do so. You know, most of your Bibles have this, whether it be NIV or ESV. You'll see little footnotes, little reference notes. I call them little footnotes. I know that's not the technical term for them. And down at the bottom of the page, you have different things that will describe what the notes are there. And when you see the word Hosanna, Hosanna, it actually says that it means save us. Save us. And when I was younger, I used to think that, you know, when they would shout that, that they were just saying, you know, okay, it was a way of praise. And it was a way of praise. But there was a deeper meaning to it. They were actually shouting to Jesus, Jesus, save us. And they were actually quoting scripture to him as well. Think about what we just read in Matthew. And now let's turn our attention to Psalm 118, 25 to 26. It says, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Sounds very similar, right, to what we were just reading in Matthew. The reason why is because they were shouting scripture to Jesus. They were taking it right from the Old Testament, proclaiming, Lord, save us. Hosanna means Hosanna. save us. You guys are getting good. <laughs> so what do they need saved from? You know, once again, I always thought it was just a, a word of praise that we sang, and it certainly was. There was more to it, but it also means saved. And if you look in your Bible, it says it means saved. What do they need saved from? They're God's people. Well, the answer to that is wrong. The answer to that is wrong. They need saved from the nation of Rome. They were under foreign occupation. They were under foreign rule. At that point in time, God's people were under occupation the same way they were when they were under Babylon, the same way they were when they were under the rule of Persia. They were being exploited. They were being subjugated. You know, Rome wasn't really uh, really what it was all cracked up to be. It was great if you were Roman to be a part of Rome, but to be one of their subjects, to be one of the, the objects of their conquest, it wasn't always the greatest thing. Rome ruled the world with iron fist. At the height of their power, they were actually at the height of their power during the time of Jesus. And I just want to show you a picture. This gives you an idea of uh, how vast the Roman Empire was during this time. You see that much of the known world was under Roman rule. Keep in mind, at this time, you know, they didn't know about the United States of America. The America they didn't have discovered it yet. Now, you know, so all the known world, of course, you have, you know, China, and you have, you know, you have the East there. But once again, the Roman Empire, their empire stretched down to Africa, the Middle East. Even as far as Great Britain and England, that's the expanse of the Roman Empire. They knew conquest very, very well, and they were efficient at it. And once again, God's people suffered. You think of Roman taxes, how they would steal from God's people, they would take whatever they wanted. You think of uh, the way that they ruled, and there was cruelty in the way that they uh, subjugated them. This was not a very good time for God's people. And I want to read from you uh, what Paul and Hendricks described, and they actually quote from the historian of Josephus. It says, Josephus tells us that they were pretty abusive and corrupt administrators, robbing the people in order to line their own pockets. The situation in Jerusalem was becoming very, very tense indeed. This was an extremely tense time for God's people. And actually, one of the reasons some people could speculate why the Pharisees were so quick to crucify Jesus because they were afraid. It had things got out of hand, they would have canceled Passover. Rome had the power to do that. They had the power to cancel the entire festival. No more sacrifices would have been made. The high priest couldn't go to the Holy of Holies. That wouldn't have happened. That terrified God's people. They ruled everywhere they conquered with an iron fist. Rome was not such a good thing. And for me, I you know, when I was a kid, I loved Rome. I loved watching you know, I've actually had the opportunity to go to Rome and go to Rome, and not just the city, but just you know, seeing the, the, the effects of the empire throughout that area. It's an incredible thing to study the history. 
And one thing I think that we do is we kind of idolize Rome. I'm guilty of that. You know, like I think, wow, the Colosseum, wow, all the great things they did. It is a marvel the things that they came up with, right? You think of uh, the aqueducts and the roads and the fact that they were on the shared language and just like, everything they did. It's just, yeah, that is like impressive stuff. And it's easy to have this great high concept, high idolization of Rome. But what you have to keep in mind is that if you were living during that time, if you were, you know, if you were a Roman, things were great. You know, if you were a pilot or maybe one of the soldiers, yeah, the soldiers, you know, you're still a soldier, you're still not, you know, up there in class, but there's a lot of privileges that came with Roman citizenship. We see that for Apostle Paul and his book of Acts and how that really helped him out on a lot of bands because he was a Roman citizen. So if you were uh, someone being ruled by Rome, if you were one of their uh, people that they conquested the way the nation of Israel was, it wasn't such a great thing. We see their crosses, and we think of that with Jesus, but that was a common practice by the Romans. They didn't choose crucifixion because it was the easiest way of killing, because it was the cheapest way of killing. It was a, it was a, a deterrent. It was a way to spread fear and to, to let people know that, you know what, if you mess up, if you fight up against us, that's where you're going to be. Rome wasn't the greatest thing. And when they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna! what they were saying was, save us, Lord, save us from the Romans, deliver us. And I want to read for you just a quote from Dr. Scott Hastings. He says, unfortunately, the praise of the people lavished on Jesus was not because they recognized him as their savior from sin, they welcomed him out of their desire for a messianic deliverer, someone who would lead them in a revolt against Rome. There were many who did not believe in Christ as a savior, nevertheless hoped that perhaps he would bring to them a, who could be a great temporal deliverer. Once again, their mindset of what Jesus was going to do had nothing to do with him saving them from their sin. And they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, to save them. So that's why Hosanna. Hosanna. That's no. So that's the fourth, the third question, the third why, and the fourth is this: Why the cross? Why the cross? How did it ever get to that point? You know, it's only five days from the time when Jesus came, was triumphal entry, when people walked into their city, they spread their clothes, they threw the, the branches down, they proclaimed him to be king. What happened? How did those shouts of Hosanna? Hosanna. Hosanna. Go to the shouts of crucify him. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a timeline just to give you an idea of uh, what happened during Holy Week. So we see, you know, on Palm Sunday, and you can see all the different events taking place, whether it be, you know, Wednesday, Judas agreeing to betray Jesus. Thursday, we have the, uh, the Last Supper, when Jesus gave us communion, and when he was taken in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then Friday, when Jesus was put on the cross. Just five days. Just five days. What happened? How did we get there? You know, thinking we of this king riding in the city, how did it get from the king to the one who would try to be crucified? And what happened? It was all because of their false expectations of Jesus. What we just read, when they cried to Jesus, when they proclaimed him, it wasn't because they thought he was coming to save them from their sins. Their expectation was the Messiah would come and save them from Rome. And there was this expectation of the Messiah, maybe you've heard this before, the Davidic Messiah. And what they thought was, okay, when the Messiah would come, like, what's really sad is because the nation of Israel is still waiting for this Messiah. For those who do not know Jesus is Lord, they're still waiting for this Messiah to come. And what they believed the Messiah would do is they believed the Messiah would be a great king. The same way that David was a great king. We see that you know, David, he set up the city of Jerusalem, he set up the kingdom of Israel. And during that time, the kingdom of Israel was a major player known world. They were a powerhouse. They were a force to be reckoned with. That's what they thought that Jesus was going to do. This Davidical Messiah was going to deliver them from their foreign oppressors, liberate them from Rome, and put Israel back on the map. That's not what Jesus did. They didn't understand the big picture. They didn't understand that Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. So you can see, if you didn't understand the big picture, when you read that scripture, 
where you would make that conclusion, right? You're going to sit on David's throne. You're going to restore David's throne. Keep in mind, there was no king of Israel since the time of Babylon. And you see what happened here from Babylon to Persia, to Greece, to Rome, this, you know, this time of oppression. People were just clamoring for this Messiah to come. They thought that, okay, once the Messiah comes, once again, they're going to take away Rome, and they're going to make the nation of Israel power once again. They would make this kingdom that would never end. Jesus did that. I don't want you to think that Jesus was the political Messiah. He did that. He established it once again, his kingdom is not of this world. He was this great, wonderful counselor, this prince of, prince of peace, mighty God. But what they didn't understand is Jesus wasn't there to, to liberate them from Rome, to save them from Rome, and to, to elevate the nation of Israel. He was there to save all of the people in the world from their sin. That's what Jesus did. And because of their false expectations, because they thought Jesus was going to do something completely different, they crucified him. Jesus he is the Davidic Messiah, but he's also a suffering servant. That's another uh, uh, role of the, of the Messiah that was to come. You're the suffering servant. And we like reading about the Davidic Messiah. We re like reading about this mighty king, but suffering servant? Really? You're trying to tell me that the Messiah, there's one to come, who's going to set up David's throne? He's going to suffer? He's going to be this, uh, this man? Passover king? It's unthinkable to think this will happen to and what happens is, you know, they focus on that passage, but I don't think they read the rest of Isaiah. You know, I don't think they fully really understood what was going to come later on, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. But surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, and each of us has turned to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was the true mission of the cross. That was the reason why Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem. It was all leading to the cross. It was all leading to that moment that he took upon our sin, and that he was raised from the dead, giving us the victory and salvation God's people didn't understand that. Like I said, you can see why they were focused on this coming king, this great king, the great Messiah, and maybe not so much think so much about the suffering servant. And because of the false expectation of Jesus, they crucified him. The shouts of Hosanna. Hosanna! Hosanna shouts of crucify him. I want to read you once again from God's perspective, Scott and read them. These are the ones who hail him as their king. With their shouts of many hosannas, <laughs> recognizing him as the son of David, who came in the name of the Lord. But when he failed in their expectations, when he refused to lead them in a massive revolt against the Roman occupiers, the crowds quickly turned on him. Within just a few days, the hosannas <laughs> changed the shouts and cries and crucified him. Those who hailed him as a hero would soon reject him. So why the cross? They didn't understand what Jesus' mission was. They didn't understand who Jesus is. And the thing is, and we'll talk about this in a second, there's danger to happen when we have false expectations of Jesus. And we don't understand who Jesus really is. We do that sometimes. And it's dangerous. And because of their false expectations, because they didn't understand Jesus' mission, that's what led to the cross. That's why in five days, the people turn on him so quickly. And when I was younger, I couldn't understand that. I was like, man, there had to be something more, but no. They didn't understand what Jesus was really coming to do. And that is why the cross. So four wives of Palm Sunday. Let's recap a little bit. Why the donkey? You know, it wasn't just because Jesus was a big fan of Shrek. You know, it's because it was prophesied. Also, because it represented peace and humility, the exact nature of who Jesus why the entry? Why did Jesus have this big parade, this big, you know, this big exciting thing? Why not come in the middle of the night? But Jesus was declaring publicly that yes, he is the King of Kings and Lords of Lords. He is the coming Messiah. Why the Hosanna? Hosanna! Why did God's people shout this of Jesus? Yes, there was a way of praising him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But Hosanna! 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 Save, Lord, save us from the Romans. 
God's people were suffering under Rome, and they were looking for that Savior to save them from the Roman oppressors. And then why the cross? Because they didn't understand who Jesus was and who Jesus is. They didn't understand his mission. And because of he didn't meet their expectations, they turned on Jesus and demanded his crucifixion on the cross. I just want to leave you with two thoughts as we uh, prepare our hearts for Holy Week to think about Palm Sunday. Have you ever cried out, Hosanna? Hosanna! Have you ever cried that out to him? Now, you may not have uh, used the word Hosanna, but you guys are getting tired, it's okay. <laughs> you may not have you know, said that, those exact words to him, but hopefully, each and every one of us has cried that out to Jesus in our own way. We all need a Savior. That's part of coming to know who Jesus is, the fact that he is that Savior. We do need to save from our sins. Yes, right now we live in this free country. We're not being oppressed the way that God's people were. You know, yeah, there are things in our government that maybe we don't like, but we're not being ruled with an iron fist the way that Rome was ruling God's people at that time. But even still, we need a Savior. We need to recognize the mission of Christ, not to save us from our own, not to save us from our oppressors here, but to save us from our ultimate foe, Satan, and death, and sin, as we studied last week, that's why Jesus came to this world. That's why Jesus went to the cross. We need to have cried out, Hosanna to Jesus. Hosanna to in our lives. We need a Savior. We need to be saved from our sin. And the second is this. What is your false expectation of Jesus? Do you have false expectations of him? You're like, I don't think so. But it's dangerous. Because what happens is when we have false expectations of Jesus, we turn on him. The same way that God's people turn on him. You see this happen all the time. You know, these people decide they want to give their lives to Christ, and you know, people leave them thinking, okay, if you just give your life to Jesus, everything's gonna be great, nothing bad's gonna happen to you. And what happens? Something bad happens. And then we blame God. We say, God, I thought you loved me. God, I thought if I followed you, everything would be good, and I would never know suffering, everything would be great. People harden their hearts to the world and they turn their backs on him. Because they have this false expectation that Jesus is going to do something which he never promised. The same way that the Israelites at the time, you know, they turned their backs on Jesus because their expectation was Jesus was going to come and be the next David and do all these things, but Jesus didn't promise that. We need to be careful that we don't have false expectations of Jesus, that we understand what it means to follow him, that we understand what it means to be his disciple and to make him know. You know, one thing that I did before I gave my life to Christ, I talked about this a little bit at a teacher experience study. Before I came to the Lord, I wanted to know everything, you know. I wanted to know what I was signing up for. You know, when you would download a program or something, there'd be terms and conditions, and we always go, yeah, 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 and we go down and accept all. That wasn't me when I was a teenager. I was like, if I'm going to follow this Jesus, I want to know what I'm signing up for. So it was about a year of going to youth group and studying God's word before I gave my life to Christ. Because I wanted to make sure that, you know what, I didn't have false expectations. Do you have false expectations of Jesus? I encourage you to study God's word, to know who Jesus is. That way, if you're cry your cries and your shouts of acclamation, and when you give your life to Jesus, it doesn't turn the way that it turned for God's people to shout this peace about him. May you come know the Lord. May you come to worship him and walk in these footsteps during this holy week. Let this be a special time. Let me pray with you. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. God, we thank you that Jesus would come to this world to save a sinner like me, like all of us in this room. God, your word tells us that we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and boy, do we know it, Lord. God, you know everything that we've ever done. Even more so than that, you know, you know every thought that we've ever had. It's a scary thing, oh God, when we take that moment to reflect upon our lives and how sinful we are. But yet, even in that moment of sinful rebellion, you sent your Son to come to this world, to die on the cross for us, to take upon that punishment that we so deserve. And Lord, as we start this holy week, as we I think about today, as Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem with the shouts of praise and people proclaiming him as king, God, I pray that we would do the same, Lord, that we would have that same expectation, that same excitement for this week, oh God, for what you're going to do in our hearts and our lives this week as we turn our eyes to you. But God, I pray that we would know you for who you are, 
spoke what we would know your word. We would have false expectations in our lives of what you're going to do. God, we recognize that uh, there are things that we think that they should go a certain way, but then it's your will. God, I pray that our, our pride of our hearts would just be lightened and become your will be done each and every day of our lives. In every situation in our life, Lord, that we would hold nothing of that for ourselves, that we'd be fully surrendered to you and your will. God, we give this week to you. May you prepare our hearts as we prepare for Easter and the cross and what you did for us. God, we love you. Truthfully, scribes, as we sing our final song, he is exalted.